talk about your vision of the role of innovation, the role of economic growth. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me set it up by saying I spend most of my time traveling in the world. The US seems, the con consensus is that Asia is growing faster than 2%, 4, 5, 6%, depending on who you believe. The US is growing somewhere between 1 and 2%, and that seems sustainable. And Europe is, seems to be entering into its uh, third uh, recession. recession. Right. Um, and no one ever mentions Africa, although Africa is, in fact, doing relatively right. well. Mm -hmm. um, is that roughly correct, a sort of a global <laughs> model? What are the subtleties? Is it going to continue? So let's start by okay. the, over five years. Sure. Does, it, does it stay that way? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. So, but I, I have to say, because, I, because of our conversation last night and because of that brilliant opening. So last night, um, Eric warned me that he was going to do solely optimism in his speech. And he said he had another 10 minutes where he could possibly do pessimism. So what he decided instead was to have his first speaker be someone from the dismal science, the <laughs> economics, to kind of try to put it back into things like growth rates, technological displacement of jobs, inequality, all the things that my economists' friends are worrying about when they hear all of that brilliant technology. So I just want to get it out of the way. That's my assigned role here, all right? <laughs> That's it. Okay. Now, having taken my assigned role, because I love Eric and I love Google, and I also am a technology optimist, uh, I can answer your question. Um, you know, as far as the emerging markets versus the developed countries are concerned, sure, they're good. they've been growing faster than developed countries for the past 20 years. That's going to continue for demographic reasons, for catch-up reasons. They can jump to the frontier. They can develop technologies that uh, they can go to the best technologies and not go through all the old ones to get there. Uh, the, a number of them have embraced the global economy. Obviously, that was that is a key ingredient of China's success. So I, I don't see that difference uh, in growth rates uh, declining. I, I think the emerging markets grow faster. I think that uh, Europe is in a, in a terrible situation uh, demographically. It's also in a terrible situation in terms of policy decisions they have made. They've taken the, the Great Recession, which didn't start there, which encompassed them, and they have made it ever much worse for themselves. And you can see that really. Just take Italy. Italy's income today is about where it was in 2000. So from an Italian citizen's point of view, from the Italian economy's point of view, the euro from 2000 to now has not generated an increase in living standards. So this is a, you know, that, that's just one example. Um, even in Germany, by the way, the powerhouse that we think of, I think industrial production hasn't been going anyplace for three years. It's basically stagnant. So I worry about Europe, I worry about Japan. Uh, I worry about the U.S. The way I would worry about the U.S. really is, and it gets to the point of the technology, that we had 40 years going into the Great Recession of essentially stagnant family incomes. Stagnant family incomes. We had, uh, if you look at median wages for full-time employed male workers, no increase. Uh, this was before the Great Recession. So the Great Recession, 2008 to 2009, and now the very slow recovery, has not reversed any of those long-run trends. And frankly, as you know, Eric, from the discussions we've had about this, one of the prime sources of the inequality of the erosion of the middle is technological change, which is taking out jobs faster than it's creating them, and which has enabled the globalization, which has taken out other jobs. So jobs move from the US to another location that's enabled by technology. So you got technology having two effects on middle income, the growth of middle income. So people are looking at all this wonderful change and saying, oh my goodness, this could accelerate the erosion of jobs. So when you talk about Uber as a positive, there are lots of economists who will talk about Uber as a negative from the point of view of middle income jobs. When you talk about the amazing changes in health possibilities, and economists will say, well, who's going to pay for that? Does everybody have access to this? And if not, on what principle do we decide who has access and who doesn't? So I, I'll sort of end this part of my discussion by remember reading back when I was dean at Haas, I think when we first met, uh, the article by Bill Joy about superhumans, <laughs> the 1998 uh, Wired 
That article scared me to death then, and it seems to be relevant to today because the technology is not going to be available, at least as far as we know, to transform the lives of everyone to the same extent, at least for the foreseeable future, and a lot of lives are being seriously disrupted by the technology. So that's the negative. Put it all together, and I don't, I don't, I, at least I think that would be the, the negative part of your speech, perhaps. You, I don't know. Of course, you did a much better than, job than I would. <laughs> um, the article she's referring to is by Bill Joy, my close friend, um, in Wired. It's called The Future Doesn't Need Us, and yes. it's the most widely uh, circulated article that Wired has ever published. Uh, and it's quite stunning to read even today. It really is. Um, and it's a relatively dystopian view of what innovation can do in the genetic realm, uh, and in particular the issues of what evil people can do. And he yes. sort of foresaw many of the things that we worry about today. Right. Um, uh, given you have such experience in Europe, I, I think, let, let's do one more question about sure, Europe. Sure, sure. Um, so I was in London two days ago. And uh, there's a vote on Thursday as to whether Scotland will leave the euro. I know. Um, the Scottish people are 50-50. The London people think it's foolish, and mo nobody thinks they're going to do it. Um, this, uh, because of this vote, there's been a lot of discussion about secessionist movements, um, making sort of smaller scale events, mm -hmm. consistent with my thinking, and you heard from my talk, that making things smaller is not such a good idea. You need scalable mm -hmm. platforms. And so disconnecting from the scalable platform. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm assuming that the correct answer for Europe is not to break it up, but to make it work. Do you agree with that? And is there <clears throat> any hope for that occurring? Well, actually, I certainly agree with the general principle. I, don't, I, I think that the Scottish vote in a small but very significant way it signals that something else that you, you didn't mention the term nationalism in your discussion, but we have this very odd moment of time now where the world has, by every single measure, except maybe short-term global financial flows, by every other measure you could imagine, the world is more interconnected. It's more interconnected than it was in 2007. I mean, the Great Recession took it all down in terms of the pace of interconnection, but the direction continued. So we've got the most interconnected world ever, and at the same time, we have the rise of nationalism. And you can see that in Russia. You can see that in the Ukraine. You can see that throughout the Middle East. You can see that all around the world, including in Scotland. And I don't, you know, to have the scalable platforms you're talking about, to have the global <coughs> trade and the flow of technology and the flow of ideas, which has led to this amazing technological revolution, you need international rules, you, you need rules, uh, you know, you need regional rules, and sometimes you need international rules. So, for example, one of the things that has completely slowed down right now are the two big trade talks, one in the Trans-Pacific, one the Transatlantic. The Transatlantic trade talks have, have basically stalled because everybody has to turn their attention to the Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really think we're at a moment in time when there's stress being put on the 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 development of and the maintenance of global systems which are required to allow this technology and all of the economic benefits of it to flow freely. I do worry so, about that. So if we return to the US, mm -hmm. and again, you've been heavily involved in on the Democratic mm -hmm. side, both politically as well as in the government, mm -hmm. member of the Council of Economic Advisors, head of the Economic Advisors, and so forth. During your term uh, in the government, things were prosperous. Yes, we were very, we were very lucky. You get, you get uh, in government, you get blamed when things go badly. You get praised when things go well, even though, to a very significant ex extent, uh, we w uh, President Clinton, the, the policies we pursued, I think, were exactly right. But we also happened to be sitting there at a moment in time when the explosion of technological possibilities through the Internet was just developing, exploding around well, Why don't us. we do that again? Well, well, you know, I, I'm seems like a good deal to me. <laughs> it was a very good deal, and what I would say is, so as you may know, and I put this out here as a challenge to everyone else, there is a debate going on among economists and technology optimists and technology pessimists right now about whether all this wonderful technology that you're talking about is really growth enhancing or not. Um, so that there really? are, there, yes, there, there really is, there really is. So there are two debates. Is anyone familiar with the history of America? Uh, I, look, I, 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 I will, 
I'm a technology optimist, so there are people who are writing very serious and discussed papers, uh, Lauren Summers being one of them, Robert Gordon being another, saying we're in for a period of yeah. slow growth, much slower growth, despite the technology. But the second thing, since I don't necessarily buy into that, is we may continue to grow rapidly, and productivity may continue to... So all this new technology you're talking about boosts productivity growth back up. We get out of this slow recovery. We're barreling along. But that productivity growth does not have to be shared as we might like it to be shared. <clears throat> so this is the issue of inclusive growth or inclusive productivity growth. I thought that <clears throat> McAfee and Bryn Gilson in their book, they had this wonderful expression of brilliant machines bring great bounty, bounties productivity. Okay. But the bounty may not be evenly or fairly shared. That's inclusive productivity. So I, I think we need to think about, as policymakers, yes, let's assume that this wonderful technology is going to continue to be an engine of growth and productivity in the United States. And let's think about what we need to do to make the sharing of that bounty a more inclusive share. Yeah, so my problem with this is I, when I think about it, I think, OK, so why don't we just build this future, and then if it creates dislocations, we'll use social policy yeah. Redistribution to address That's that. That's fine. Okay, that would be my sort of religion or you and I view. would probably be. So, so <laughs> what's the alternative view? Same place. It's block technological progress, and this, and and what? No, I don't. Uh, well, uh, not your view, not my view, but but the other side has to have a coherent view no, too. But there, but no, there are, there are two other sides. Okay. Okay. So you and I are in the same place. No wonder we also advise the same people. So. Um, but there are two other ways of looking at it. One is block the technological progress because the bounty is not evenly shared. It's not inclusive. It's hurting too many people. The net disruption of jobs is, uh, is a positive net disruption of jobs. It's not a positive net creator of jobs. Let's do something about it. The other view is, who cares? That's just the way it is. Society is unequal. It's, uh, it's a race for the winners. Uh, we don't really, people should, you know, we live in a market system. The market generates income. The income is increasingly unequal. Uh, maybe we should care about, I would say, for, for even for that camp, even for that camp, and there are plenty of people in that camp, um, the thing you can get people to worry about is the vicious cycle of income inequality educational inequality and social inequality leading to even greater inequality because we know that income inequality is associated with uh, differences in educational opportunities. We can see this very clearly. The educational gap between, say, the top 20% of the United States and the bottom 20% by measures of educational attainment levels has doubled. It's doubled. It's crazy. It's crazy. We're, we're a country in which educational attainment is quite tied to income level. So we should be able to do something about that and use the technology and use our commitment of, natu of our resources to actually at least deal with giving people a reasonable uh, starting place which is leveled through education and then let them run the race. The system may end up with high levels of inequality, but we shouldn't let that be created over and over again in terms of opportunity for so our young. Are there things... Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there things that we can learn or learn not to do from the Asian experience? Um, a, a sort of simple model of Asia is that the Asia that I'm talking about, China, Taiwan, sure. Hong Kong, uh, Korea, those sorts of countries, Japan, are very, very education focused. Mm -hmm. um, they may or may not be democratic by our terms, and they have different sort of social and religious cultures. But one thing that they care a lot about is education. Right. And those stereotypes appear to me to be true. Mm -hmm. And when you look at uh, corporations, I was part of a series of studies on manufacturing, the quality of the manufacturing workers are higher, you know, they're just better than in the US. Yeah. They're better educated, doing the same jobs, just better educated. Um, is there something that we should copy or not copy from the Asian success model? <laughs> Well, you know, we've, uh, we, we, we do start in the United States with a system which is very much based on local control of education. And local control of education means, therefore, that uh, it has meant major differences in access to good education because the income levels of... Look, 
income has become more unequal, sort of locational segregation, where you grow up, has become more unequal as income has become more unequal. The problem schools are actually in, in general, the poorest locations. Uh, we, we can certainly do much more than we do about that, but it, in terms of resource shifts, that is a question of politics. Are we willing at the federal level? You know, people want, there are lots of people in one of the camps I talked about who would like to see, they'd like to see nothing better than re eliminating the Department of Education. The Department of Education does not do that much at K through 12 education. Their hands are actually pretty tied. Most of the resources of the Department of Education are not available for K through 12. You could imagine a system which was much more uh, trying to level the playing field through resource allocation, through access to the internet, the technology, the skilled teachers who could come in uh, that dealt with some of these inequalities. It's a political uh, decision. It's a political decision. Of course, the other thing that these societies do, and you could put in a number of European societies at this point, the Scandinavian countries you mentioned, the other thing they do is they highly value the teaching profession. They highly value it in terms of relative income, in terms of status, and in terms of uh, all of the things a teacher has to work with children. Imagine what we have just done in the United States. During the period of the Great Recession and recovery to today, we actually eliminated a lot of primary school teachers. We went after the, the government workers and we basically said, government workers are greedy, they have, un, unfair, un -large, they have too large pensions, they're paid too much. A lot of those government workers were women who teach. That's who they were. So we ha if we're going to commit to solving education problems, I think look to the relative to the size of these economies and development level, look to the relative resources they put into this and the status that they give to it as, as necessary, uh, a necessary, it may not be sufficient, certainly I'm not saying there isn't any room for educational reform, but it may be absolutely necessary. So I, I, I think we, we can do it. So the US has the resources, we have the capability. This is a matter of political will and seeing the problem as maybe you and I see it, but I would have to say that, again, it's not commonly shared. And we're going to hear in a bit about another distortion of the inequality. I've been talking about income inequality, educational inequality, opportunity. The other distortion, of course, in our system is the ability to have voice in policy. The ability to have voice in policy. And as we become more and more unequal, and we've created a system where having voice is more and more tied to having the payment for voice, those kinds of arguments I'm talking about so, get drowned out. So, so our final question goes to the following. So mm -hmm. it's 2016, 2017, and you foolishly have decided to go back in as mm -hmm. Secretary of Treasury, Council of Economic Advisors, mm -hmm. and you really are in charge of the economic policy from 2017 to 2020. <laughs> What would you do different mm -hmm. in hindsight and given where we are now? Is it, it are things going at an at a economic policy yes. government level, are they going well enough that it's best to leave things alone and let the free market do things? I mean, after all, the Congress is not passing any laws. They sort of forgot how to do that. Right. So, so the, the, <laughs> they the, stopped the, doing so, it. So, right. so the, the administrative, the, the administration, political, Republican or Democratic, has a huge role to play because they are, in fact, acting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you do anything different? So the, the answer, of course, is if I, w if, uh, if I went back, I would go believing as I went, as I did when I went, that there are some things that are the appropriate role of government and that government, when it does things, can certainly improve what it does and perhaps can do more things. So let me just talk about... So, I came to, I probably met Eric through the, through the train of thinking was about U.S. competitiveness. So what is it that makes the U.S. an attractive place to do the kinds of wonderful things with wonderful job opportunities that uh, Eric was talking about? So what, what are they? So the list is pretty straightforward. Um, part of it is in, in process, but we can do much more, and that is improving uh, 
STEM education throughout the system from preschool. <laughs> I'm really talking about STEM, from preschool. STEM is science, education. Technology, and, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Yes. Okay, STEM. Um, so that's one. Two, uh, believe it or not, given what I was just talking about in terms of disruption, is uh, immigration reform. And immigration reform both because in order to pull the technology and pull the productivity benefits, we know that we're hitting uh, sort of constraints on the complementary talent pool we need to work with the technology. But we also need to deal with the reality that a significant part of our everyday workforce consists of immigrants, many of whom are not legal. We've got to deal with that, so I would put that down. Immigration, STEM. I would put down finishing these trade agreements, which actually are very, very important over the next 10 to 20 years for the kind of global platforms that you are running. I would put down what I haven't mentioned, and it will probably make you think, is she really a, a liberal at all? And that is uh, corporate tax reform. Again, I'm thinking about what brings the stuff here, what keeps the stuff here, as opposed to uh, gets the stuff to go other places. So I actually think corporate tax reform is very important. Tax reform in general, because I would like to see us move to a corporate tax reform with something like a value-added tax or a carbon tax. You know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about Europe is that when income inequality can be measured pre-tax and pre-transfer, it's market, it's the inequality that the market generates. The U.S. actually doesn't look that different from other developed countries in terms of the market generating inequality. We got a bit more at the top 1%. Our top 1% is pulled away a bit more. But what we have much more pronounced than the other developed societies is the after tax and after transfer. We're, we're not providing the resources for education, the resources for childcare, the resources for early childhood education, the resources for family support, uh, and until recently, the resources for health for middle-income families. We don't, we don't do it. So we, we collect less in revenue and we give out less in transfer payments. The net effect of this is our inequality, after we've done all that, is much more pronounced. We haven't done much to eliminate the inequality. So I think there's a lot we can do. So you could see if I were in government, we'd be following a fairly activist agenda. Um, and uh, that'll just have to be decided in the election coming up. Uh, thank you for <laughs> your service to our country. Thank you very much, Thank Eric. you. Congratulations on your role at Berkeley. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.